about um, the new thing that God was doing. Uh, and this, this week, I'm going to spend some time talking about trusting God. But I, it's interesting, every, every time God moves us, he, he gives us a new anointing for the new move. He doesn't want us to rely on the old anointing for the new thing. And isn't that just like God? He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do the new thing in their life. And I'm going to add to them a new anointing that will enable them to be successful in the new thing. That's exciting. Because God is always filling us afresh. He's always wanting us to be ready and prepared and enabled for the new thing that he's doing. He doesn't want us to rely on what was. He supplies us fresh every day. And so the new thing that God is doing in your life you ought to understand that there's a new equipping that accompanies the new thing. So whatever difficulties that may be attached to the new thing, you have the grace that enables you to overcome those difficulties. You don't have to worry whether or not you can do it. When God moved you to the new thing, he said you can do it. And he enables you to do it. All right. I, I wanted to share that with you because I think sometimes, um, you know, we're constantly asking God to, to do something in our life, to, to move us in this way, to enhance us in that way. And he wants to. And then, and then when he does, we question whether or not we are capable like, you probably should have figured that out before you start asking. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you're capable because I enabled you. I equipped you. I anointed you to do the new thing. So I want to spend some time this morning talking about uh, trusting God. And I've got several stories. I may not get to them all, but I definitely wanted to use two stories that you all are very familiar with. Uh, one is the story of David and Goliath. The other is the story of Peter walking on water. Uh, you know these two well. So let's look at uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. It says, don't worry about the Philistine. This Philistine is Goliath. David told Saul, I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. Isn't that interesting? Saul doesn't want to go fight, but he's telling the person who does want to go fight that you can't win. Yeah, I, think that's, I think that's hilarious. Um, he says, You've only, you're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this with both lions and bears. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine, too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. How many know the best time to start trusting God is not when you're facing Goliath? That's, that's not the best time to start trusting God. Unfortunately, though, we kind of go through life. And 
we don't really put our trust in God. We just sort of live life. And then when the Goliath comes, we don't have this trust to be able to deal with the Goliath in our life because all the other lions and the bears, we've just sort of just disregarded it. So now, what I need to deal with the Goliath in my life, I don't have. And what ends up happening is what ends up happening with Israel. Um, let's look at verse 24. Verse 24 says, As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away. Him is Goliath. They began to run away in fright. See, what happens is when we don't have the, 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 the intestinal fortitude to deal with Goliath, we'll give Goliath free reign in our life. And you know the other thing we'll do? We'll avoid him. So they, the Israelites, ran away from him. And they, they, they acted like he wasn't even there. And so for 40 days he'd come out and he just would pretty much punk them, right? He would punk them, and they would just run away. And what happens is that we do the same thing to stuff in our life. Things sort of mount up in our life, and, and, and we avoid it as if it's going to just sort of go away on its own. And then it'll rear its head up every so often, and it'll punk us, and then we'll go hide, and it'll, it'll dissipate until the next time. And it'll keep coming and keep coming and keep coming and keep coming until somebody who's trusting God will deal with it. Here's what's interesting about David. He was able to connect his time and his experience as a shepherd with lions and bears. And he's able to make that connection to Goliath. God works in um, graduations. He, he, he always starts us out in preschool. <laughs> Even though we think we're ready for high school. He always starts us out in preschool because he wants to put in us what we need to go to kindergarten. So he, so he, he, David, is able to recognize, you know, when I was fighting those lions and those bears, that was preschool. And God was actually preparing me for what was coming. So he's able to connect lions and bears with Goliath. And here's my question for you. Are you able to? Are you, are you able to connect those lions and those bears that are in your life? Those things that just sort of just gnaw at you. And your ability to deal with those things by trusting God so that you're ready for the thing that really, really, really is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, take some trusting in God. See, see, those things in our lives are opportunities to cut our teeth on trusting God. They're not, they're not in our lives just simply to just complain, moan, and, grain, and groan about they're not there just to, just to say, oh, this is bad, and this is bad, and I wish this, and I wish that. They're not there for that only. You can do that, but that doesn't solve anything. That doesn't get you anywhere. The question is, can I actually use these things that will fortify me, that would actually prep me, that would actually lay down a level of trust in me to know God better?
trust is an ever-increasing process of learning and being confident in the nature of God. Trust is an ever-increasing process to learn and understand and know the nature of God. The more I, I know of him, the more I learn of him, the, the greater my confidence is in the nature of God. How many know we just can't tell God we trust him? We, we actually have to show him. So, so David understands that these lions and these bears in his life are actually there for him to know God better so that when Goliath comes, there's no fear. How, how, many, know, how many know God doesn't care about lions or bears or Goliath. I mean, you know, God doesn't care that you have a cold or you have cancer. God isn't shaking in his boots because you have cancer. God doesn't care. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything if you have a cold or if you have cancer to God. It might mean something to us, but it doesn't mean anything to God. So if it doesn't mean anything to God, if, it, if to God it's all the same, then how can I establish that same kind of thinking in my mind that he has in his? See, I have, to, I have to be able to see it the way he sees it. He's not stressed out about a coal. He's not stressed out about a cancer. He's not stressed out about lions and bears. And he's not stressed out about Goliath. But we get stressed out by it. We get stressed out by it. And God is saying, I don't want you to be stressed out by it. I want you to be cool, calm, and collective. In reading this story, you find that David is more concerned about the reward than he is about Goliath. He could care less about Goliath. He's more concerned about the reward. There are lions and bears in your life right now. Deal with them the way God wants you to deal with them. Don't be afraid of them. Don't skirt the issue. Go at it. Look, here's, here's, here's the thing about being a shepherd. It's normal. It's normal. It's, 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 it's occupational hazard to have to deal with lions and bears if you're a shepherd. That's, that's occupational hazard. So it wasn't anything, un, it's, not, it's not uncommon for shepherds to have to kill lion and bears. It was normal. But for David, he recognized the hand of God in the normal thing that he was doing every day. Can we? See, when, when we can recognize the hand of God in the things that we're doing every day, and we can actually say, it's by God's hand that I was able to do this, then I come to a new level of trust and confidence in God, because I know it wasn't just my intelligence. I know it wasn't because I just had a pocket full of money. Because that pocket full of money you got because of God. Right? And so what happens is when we're able to deal with the normal things of life and we don't acknowledge God, we miss the opportunity to actually have him in our life conscious. We know he's there, but, but we're not conscious of him. 
And so I have to give him a consciousness. I have to be aware that he's in my life and he actually is doing and responding and helping me in the normal things of life. So, when a whole army, a whole army decides not to fight, God sends the lunch boy. Because <laughs> his father said, hey, go take this food to your, to your brothers on the front line. The lunch boy has got the relationship with God. The lunch boy. Who would have thought that the lunch boy was the one who was going to kill Goliath? Well, he was the one who was recognizing God in his life every day. Verse 37, it says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. He, he didn't take credit for killing the lion and the bear. He recognized it was God who was actually working through him. Do you see what I mean? This is, this is important because if we don't recognize that God is actually working through us, then we don't realize the confidence that he's trying to build in us. Right. We don't realize that. And Goliath is coming. The reason why Goliath is coming is because God actually wants to increase you. The reason why God can't increase us is because we aren't ready and prepared to fight Goliath. When we don't trust God, we miss out on several things. We miss out on the opportunity to know God more deeply. We miss out on the opportunity to be filled with courage and confidence. We miss out on the opportunity to be prepared for Goliath. God is preparing us. He's always preparing us for the next thing. Right. He, he's, he's a graduated God. Um, and. We miss out on the opportunity to acquire the reward that comes from killing Goliath. See, you, you, you've, you've heard me talk about before the difference between blessing and reward, right? Blessing we get because of who we are, right? I have children, and because they're my children, I bless them. But there are some things that I want to do with them and do for them that they have to demonstrate a level of faithfulness in order for me to do it, right? So the reward then comes because of something they've done, not simply because of who they are. And I believe that God is ready to give us rewards when we can kill our Goliaths. Everything isn't, everything isn't a blessing uh, from God. Some things are our rewards. Let's look at uh, verse 25, 17, 25. It says, have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife. And the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. Nobody took him up on his deal. 
you know, that reward is just not big enough for me to go and fight Goliath. And I'm convinced there was no reward big enough. But David is like, oh, yeah, we, 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 we got him. That's no problem. Tell me, somebody tell me what, what the king is giving away. What is the king going to give me today for killing this guy? We have to understand that God is moving us step by step into our destiny. It requires Another level of trust, a deeper level of trust. The trust that I had five years ago doesn't help me today. I need, I need a new trust and a new level of confidence, a deeper level of trust and a deeper level of confidence to be able to deal with what I'm dealing with today. Let's look at Hebrews 10. This is actually one of my favorite scriptures. It says, so do not throw away this, this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Don't throw away your confidence because your confidence is going to be richly rewarded. But right now what you have to do is you have to have endurance to be able to deal with what you're dealing with. Then God will give you what he promised he will give you. I got to have a, I got to have a level of of endurance and, and, and faithfulness and trust in God so that I can deal with the stuff that's in my life now, then he'll reward me for killing Goliath. Let me just say that we pray and we ask and we expect God to do things that are out of alignment with our level of trust for him. Yeah. We try to get God. We, we sang that song uh, about boxing him in. We, we try to box God in. And we say, okay, God, I need this. And we go through all the religious activities. We quote scripture. We, we name. We claim. We do all kind of crazy stuff. We tell people, God is going to do this. God is going to do this. We prophesy. We do it all. But then God is saying, did you kill that lion and that bear? Did you do that? Because they're still Roman and they got those lambs in their mouths and you just disregarded it. You had 100 lambs and you thought, huh, it's OK that I'm down to 97. <laughs> Not with God. Because the fact that you didn't go after the three says that there is some integrity issues you have. So right now it's three. What about when God gives you 20,000 and it's not three, but it's 3,000? And so God is saying, let's deal with the lion and the bear so that your confidence can grow. We have to have confidence in God. I can't just tell God that I have faith. I can't just tell God that I trust him. I can't just tell God that I love him. I actually have to do something. I actually have to do something. I actually 
My, my, my actions actually have to line up with what I say. Go figure. <laughs> Who would have thought that the stuff that comes out of my mouth actually has to be proven by my actions? I thought I could just sort of lay it on thick. And you have a lot of Christians who can lay it on thick. I mean, can quote scripture like it was coming out of Jesus's mouth. Can prophesy like the angels. And God is saying, did you kill that lion and that bear? Go quote that. Take Take your spear and your bow and arrow and your sling and go kill that lion and that bear. Because that's what I'm after. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, how mean is it for God to tell Abraham? For he's, he, he's, he's been waiting 25 years to have a son. Right? He, he met God when he was 75. He has a son when he's 100. He's been waiting 25 years to have this son. How mean is it for God to say, this is what the scripture says, and one day God decided to test Abraham. Oh, you just want to test him, huh? You, you woke up one morning, God, and you just decided to test him. And he tells him, Go kill your son, your only son. The one that you've been waiting 25 years to get. The one that you've attached yourself to because now he's probably like 10 or 11. Now you've got all this attachment to him. Now you tell me I got to go kill him? I think that's kind of mean. But God wants to know if you trust him. Are you willing to lay the most precious thing you have on the altar? He's going to test us. And he's going to see if we really trust him. Let's look at Matthew 14. Again, another well-known story. It says, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once and he says, don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Verse 29, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus says. Why did you doubt me? The evidence of your trust in God is getting out of the boat. We don't, we don't get to be uh, armchair quarterbacks. My evidence that I truly trust God is it requires me to get out of the boat. Here's the interesting thing. One out of 12. See, everybody wants greatness. Everybody wants, and, and they should, because I believe God puts greatness in us. But everybody's not willing to get out of the boat. 
It's, it's nice and comfy in the boat. Yeah, I was screaming when, when I saw the dude walking on the water, but that was Jesus. But this, isn't, this is okay. This isn't too bad. You want me to get out of the boat? Yeah. I, I, I want you to get out of the boat. Yeah. Yeah. We have to decide. We have to decide. Am I going to get out of this boat? This boat represents the status quo. This boat represents a normal existence, not a supernatural one. The boat represents, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's okay. It's, it's my comfort zone. You know, I'm not, tr- I'm not trying to be who I'm not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stepping out requires us to leave who we're not. It requires us to be who we're not, but who God is calling us to be. And if I'm just okay with who I am and what I am, and I'm, I'm not more concerned about what God is calling me to be, then get your comforter, lay it out, get in the boat, get your remote, and hang out. But if you really have a desire to be who God is really calling you to be, you throw the comforter away. Remember, remember I think it was um, a, a blind Bartimaeus when Jesus was going into Jericho and he was yelling, Jesus! Jesus. And they were saying, shut up. Shut up, you blind dude. And he kept yelling, and Jesus says, hey, tell him to come here. Here's what the scripture says. He said he took his cloak and he threw it aside. And so at that time, you actually had to have a certain kind of garment that would recognize you as being a beggar. What he's saying is, I'm not begging anymore. I'm done with that lifestyle. I'm done with that. I'm going to see the king because he's calling me into my new life. He's calling me into my new life, and I'm going into my new life. And so we've got to throw the stuff aside and get out of the boat. Nobody is saying it's going to be easy. In fact, I would reckon to say (laughs) it's probably going to be a little difficult because you're actually getting ready to do something that you've never done before. I I don't have anything to compare this to except my trust in God. I know the same God who rescued me from the lion and the bear is going to rescue me from Goliath. That's the only thing I got. But without that trust in the lion and the bear that God has given me, then I have no hope for stepping out of the boat. And I would be just like the other 11 who's just like, gone, man, gone. Let's see what happens. I bet you, I bet you he fall in. I bet you. How much? How much? I bet you. He ain't going to make it, man. He ain't going to make it. That's what, the, that's what the other 11 are saying. Let's see. Let's see if he makes it. Nah. Yeah, he's going to drown. Hey, man, get the rope ready. Get the, get the life preserver ready because we're going to have to throw it in and get him. Look, he, he, he's like, forget all of that. I'm stepping into my destiny. Once you walk on water, what's somebody going to tell you now? I'm trusting God like it is nobody's business. Like it's nobody's business. Because I, I did something that no other human being other than Jesus was able to do. Nobody else can put that on their resume. 
My resume walked on water. He did what? <laughs> he lying. He ain't walk on no water. Yeah, go look on Facebook. It's on there. <laughs> I walked on water. We have something now that we can draw from for the rest of our life because God revealed himself to me in my experience. It's like what Christopher was saying. Look, this worship and this praise, this ain't about what my mother told me and what my uncle told me and, and what my, my great drunk cousin told me. This is something that I have to experience for myself so that I know God is a good God. I have to know that for myself. I can't rely on somebody else telling me. I got to know he's a good God. I got to know that when he speaks a word to me, that I actually can trust the word. Look, Peter's smart. He's like, okay, now I've seen him say stuff before. And when he said stuff, it happened. So if I'm going to walk on this water, he's got to say it. So, Lord, just say the word. Just say it. Jesus says, come on. He's like, that's all I need. And so we have to be able to have the same confidence in the word of God. So that when he says it, we can actually step out on the word of God. And too often, we're like not really sure about the word of God. We're more sure about the money in our pocket. We're more sure about our jobs. We're more sure that, you know, I got it in with good with so-and-so. They're going to help me out. I'm more sure about that. I'm not that sure about the word of God. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put my trust in my money. I'm going to put my trust in my job. I'm going to put my trust in who I know. I'm not going to put my trust in the word of God. (coughs) What happens when the person you know dies? What happens when they lay you off your job? And what happens when... Something tragic happens in your life. You got to spend all your money. Now what you going to trust? Who are you going to trust? Because you haven't developed the trust in God. Haven't, haven't developed that trust. And then we have to learn to live with Goliath. Yeah, it's about noon. He's going to come out and he's going to punk me today. I got my Nikes on. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. Come on, little kids, get your Nikes on. Y'all got to run too. And we teach our children to run. We don't teach our children to stand on the word of God because we haven't stood on the word of God. So now they grow up getting punked by Goliath. And then it becomes a religious activity. We all, we come to church on Sunday, we sing hallelujah, but then when we walk out and Goliath punks us, we run. My sure footing is the word of God. What makes the word of God alive is when I experience, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste it and see that he's good. Don't don't just get told by it by somebody else. Testimony is good. Testimony is good. But I have to experience it for myself. I have to experience him for myself. Then the word becomes alive in me. It becomes useful to me. And it doesn't matter what my mama told me. Here's my experience in trusting God. Here's what I know the nature of God is. 
So when a whole army decides not to fight, when 11 disciples decide not to get out of the boat, guess what? I'm going to get my five rocks because I'm going to fight Goliath. Yes, sir. I'm taking off my sandals because I'm getting ready to get my feet wet. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter if anybody's going with me, I'm going. Because I have to trust God. I have to learn that this is the nature of God, that this is who he is. Let me just say, if we're not willing to get out of our boats, and if we're not willing to go and fight Goliath, man, our lives are just sort of like a waste. It's just a waste. God has actually called us to great things. He actually has called us to put us in the midst of problems. When God created the heavens and the earth and he, 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 he formed the garden and made the garden and he put the man and woman in the garden, the whole earth wasn't the garden. Their responsibility was to extend the boundaries of the garden. But Satan was on earth. That's why he said, you know, um, be fruitful and multiply and subdue. Means bring into dominion this dude that's on the earth. So their, their charge was to actually extend the boundaries of the garden so that the whole earth would look like the garden and deal with Satan who was going to come against them and trying to do it. Yeah. And so he put them there to do two things, extend the garden and deal with Satan. We want our gardens extended, but we don't want to deal with Satan. And he equipped them to be able to do that. And guess what? He equipped us to be able to do it too. I just have to learn to trust God. Listen, whatever the hard thing is for you to do, I wish I had something easy to tell you, but you just got to dive in. You just got to dive in. I mean, you can get out on the side of the boat and stick your feet in the water and get your feet wet and all that stuff. But at some point, you have to disconnect yourself from the boat. It don't count if you're still holding on to the boat. That, that's cheating. At some point, you've got to disconnect yourself from that thing. And you've got to give it up. And you have to trust God, if I said to you, hey, you know what? I went and planted some grass. I tilled the grass. I planted the grass. But you know, every day I go out and I dig it up, the grass seed that I planted, to make sure it was there and it was growing. <laughs> You'd be like, you did what? Every, every day you go out and you dig it up to see if it was there and it was growing? That's what we do with God. That's what we do with God. We plant something, and then we say, okay, God, let's see. Let's see if it's working. And we dig it up again, and he says, will you trust me that after you've planted it, after you've watered it, you no longer have control over it? Now you have to trust me for the increase. You can't go dig it up every day. New levels in God requires a deeper trust in God. When you're building buildings, I mean, when I was working at ASU, we build buildings residence halls, whatever. What I learned is that depending on the height of the building, it determined 
what kind of foundation you would have. So if we were just building like a one story, the foundation didn't have to be that deep. But if we were building something that was like 10 stories, oh, well, you got to get in the ground now. And so all of us are wanting 10 story height. But it requires us to trust God at a deeper level, to be able to sustain the height that God has taken us to. You know, here, here's, the thing about, here's the thing about blessing. Blessing is, is, can be just as, and I'll close after this, blessing can be just as, um, uh, what's the word, destructive as misfortune. If I've, if I've only equipped myself to handle 20 pounds of blessing, but I'm praying for God to give me 60 pounds of blessing, if my life is fractured, when he tries to give me the 50 pounds of blessing, it will fracture my life because I'm not able to handle the 50 pounds of blessing because I've only equipped myself to handle 10 pounds of blessing. And the weight of the blessing will actually be as destructive as misfortune in my life. I mean, for a short season, we'll be happy, yeah. But then, you know what? All the stuff that comes with it, because we didn't have the wisdom, we didn't have the intestinal fortitude, we didn't have the foresight, we didn't have the preparation to deal with all the blessing that God is pouring into our lives. So what he's saying is, I actually do want to bless you, but I need you to get stronger. I need you to get stronger. I need you to trust me at a deeper level. And when we do, God has no problem pouring into us. Look, Jesus said to Peter, I think it was Peter, go throw your line into the sea first fish you catch, it's going to have some gold coins in it. Go pay my taxes and go pay your taxes. Great. God says to Solomon, because you ask for wisdom and not these other things, you will be the richest person that ever walked the face of the earth. God doesn't have a problem giving us two coins or making us rich. He has no problem doing either. The issue is, can we handle it? Can we handle it? It's according to my faith. It's according to my trust. It's according to my ability. Not whether or not God likes me today. He likes that one more than he likes this one because that one, that one seems to get all the stuff for God and that one doesn't get anything from God. Could it be that that person trusts God? Could it be? Probably. Let's stand.